<clears throat> All right, so the talk tonight is going to be about a specific person, which is unusual for Austin School Lectures. Usually I do some like overwhelmingly large event that's unwieldy. Um, in this case, the person is named Khalid ibn Walid. Uh, he was a seventh century Arab. He was actually born probably sometime around uh, 592, so end of the sixth century, but most of his life was in the seventh century. And experiences taught me, and for those of you who've had me before, <laughs> that I should never start my stories at the beginning. I need to start my stories way before the beginning. So, so that's what I'm going to do. And that's in part because I want to make sure that I ground him firmly in the period that he's in. Like, I, I want to make sure that there's a, a good understanding of why what he does is so interesting and uh, also just sort of a sense of why it matters. Um, I'm gonna start also by making a completely subjective statement that when it gets on the Austin School YouTube channel, we'll draw a bunch of ire and I'll probably get a stream of nasty comments, but I like that. So, uh, and it is this. Khalid ibn Walid was one of the three greatest warriors of all time. And that's one of the reasons why I want to cover him, is because I just want to do a profile in a person who, uh, if, if you're interested in warfare, it totally embodied warfare. So this is a talk about war. And, and I'll probably also get a little bit of flack for over-glorifying war, which is cool too. I'm okay with that as well. Um, when I, for the record, when I was at the University of Maryland, University College, in their history department, we were trying to create a war history department. So this is part of my mental illness. Um, so having said all this, I want to start by actually attacking the way history is taught in the United States. <laughs> and uh, the reason is, is because of the way we structure Western civilization courses. So if you take Western Civ 1 and Western Civ 2, the general idea, and most of the textbooks are set up this way, is that Western Civ 1 will cover everything till 1492 or 1648, whatever arbitrary year they picked to stop Western Civ 1. And then Western Civ 2 will be everything since 1648. So in other words, we're gonna spend 16 weeks talking about the first 5,000 years of Western civilization. And then we're gonna spend 16 weeks talking about the last 350, which is based on two really big flaws. The first is sort of a proximity bias because the last 350 years are closer to us, they therefore must be more important, which is definitely wrong. For example, the outcome of the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, I guarantee you has way more impact on your day-to-day -day lives than uh, the outcome of the British, one of the British defeats, <laughs> there were multiple, in Afghanistan in the 19th century. But the defeat in Afghanistan in the 19th century was it in the last 200 years, there were, the British have been beaten four times, two times in the 19th century. Um, and so it's closer to you, but it has a much smaller impact than that event 2,000 years ago, the Battle of Actium. And so for, the first problem is this bias is wrong. The second problem with this bias is its racist implications. It is a profoundly racist bias because what it attempts to do is distill Western civilization into a history of how cool white people are as opposed to actually looking at Western civilization for what it was, which was not a color-based endeavor. And if anything, it was founded by brown people. So then it, it, it's sort of an attempt by French, British, and English scholars to capture something that they didn't create, make it theirs, and then divorce it from its creators. And I can prove this to you, really simply, in fact. When you take that Western Civ I class, weeks one and two cover Mesopotamia and Egypt. 
In fact, the, the, your class is probably structured like this. Week one was Mesopotamia. Week two was Egypt. Every professor is different. Every university is different. But probably weeks um, three, four, five, and six were Greece. And then maybe seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 were Rome. And then 15 was the medieval period, which is a thousand year span of time covered in one week. And then week 16, the first part of the modern. So if they went to 1648, they, they went to that, right, in that last week. The reason why this is rooted in, in, a, in a profound form of racism is because of the following. The class admits that Western civilization was created by Iraqis and Egyptians. It starts in Mesopotamia and Egypt. It admits that. And then it, and then it pretends that Western civilization got up and ran away and began inhabiting Italy and Germany and England and never again ended up in the Middle East, which is preposterous because all the Middle East could ever do as the founder of Western civilization is simply evolve its Western civilization. Do you see what I'm saying? It, it's not like it could lose it. it is it, it just evolved differently than Italy or Germany or England. But it doesn't make it any less Western Civ. And so the way we teach Western Civ one, where we do one week, maybe, maybe two weeks on the medieval period, actually takes this to the next level. Because I'm going to talk about an event that takes place in that. We act as if the medieval period, which we call the Dark Ages, only took place in Europe. And in fact, we've renamed the birthplace of Western civilization, the Middle East, as if it's in the East, when it's clearly not in the East since it birthed Western civilization, right? <laughs> and then we ignore everything that was happening in the Middle East during the medieval period, and let me just give you an idea of what was happening in the Middle East during the medieval period. So while Europeans had no indoor plumbing and no paved roads, and their life expectancy was 40, and the way they took care of their waste was they would do it in a chamber pot and fling it into the street, the Middle East had indoor plumbing that brought fresh water in and took sewage water out. The Middle East had streets that were lit up at night with oil lamps in part because I want to set the mood, show you the technology that was available at the time, and then sh tell you why what follows follows. It's the Battle of Karhai. Uh, I didn't actually, so I pulled up this map. I was having the hardest time finding a map. I was at the point where I was going to make a map, but I was running out of time. And then I thought, you know what? I got to find something. And I kept digging and digging and digging in the Googles. And I, and I believe this is a, po uh, the man who made this map is Polish. Uh, if you're not Polish, I'm so sorry. I just guessed. Um, but it's okay because most of the names are in either the Persian names or the Roman name. Uh, if I'm wrong, forgive me, but it's somewhere right in there. So what is today? The southern end of Turkey, a little bit to the east, just north of Syria. <clears throat> the reason that battle took place is because of what a guy named Gaius Julius Kaiser did. Yeah, you guys incorrectly call him Julius Caesar. <laughs> Caesar, I'm going to do it too, because it's fun. Who doesn't like to mispronounce things on purpose? Caesar decided his family was going bankrupt, that the best way that he could solve the bankruptcy was to start an illegal war with the Celts living in Gaul, conquer them, and then plunder their resources and enslave them. And so that's what he does. And he becomes fabulously wealthy and he saves his family from bankruptcy. He was part of a secret illegal arrangement with two other men. The three men were in the Senate. There were two patricians and a plebeian. The Senate always wanted a plebeian on board. And the plebeian, of course, was Pompey Magnus, the most famous plebeian to be in the Senate. And then Caesar, who was a patrician, and another guy named Crassus. Nobody ever remembers Crassus. Crassus and Pompey hated each other's guts, 
and there was a little bit of fear that maybe a civil war would break out. So to prevent the civil war, Crassus, Pompey, and Caesar got together and created this secret little power arrangement so that they could control the Senate, and then basically the three of them would rule Rome, and everybody would pretend somebody else was doing it. Isn't that cool? Crassus sees what Caesar does, sees how wealthy Caesar becomes, and goes, wow, I want this. Crassus was the governor of Syria. So he thought, who's the nearest rich, what's the nearest rich place I can go conquer? And he went, it's Persia, let me attack it. And so he took uh, 40,000 Romans and they marched from Syria into the Persian Empire and they met at Karhai. 40,000 Romans, uh, 32,000 infantry, and they were heavy infantry, right? Think of Roman legionnaires with the interlocking shields and the spears called pilum, and they had a little gladius, a little, a little short sword, and they would march in tight ranks, heavily armored. They were basically just a giant human wall, pointy human wall, because they had the spear sticking out. And then, uh, about 4,000 light cavalry and about 4,000 medium cavalry. And they went. And they, they meet the Persians at Karhai. They meet 8,000 Persians on horseback, 8,000 infantry, uh, cavalry, and which is what they had. They had 8,000 cavalry. And the Persians that they met were light cavalry with bows and arrows. So the Romans are like, oh, we got this. 40,000 versus 8,000, what are they gonna do? Shoot arrows at us? So the Persians ride up and they fire arrows from horseback. And the Romans were like, okay, testudo. Testudo is where you take the shields, they interlocked. You could, you could connect them together. And so they locked them together this way. And then the row behind them held the shields up like this. And then the row behind them held their shields up so that they interlock to make a roof and a wall, and the Persian arrows bounce harmlessly off the top. Just, it probably sounded loud, but otherwise nobody's injured. And so at this point, the Romans are chuckling. They're like, what are you gonna do? Just keep doing that? You'll run out of arrows eventually. And so then the Romans march forward slowly, and then the Persians turn around and fire another round of, of arrows at the Romans, and then they ride off. So now the Romans think, okay, well, let's chase them. So they go out of Testudo because you can't run like this. You can't run holding a fort in the air. You need to lower your shields. So they lower their shields and they take off on foot running. And they're chasing the 8,000 Persian horse archers. The Persian horse archers turn around in their saddles and fire backwards. Nobody had ever done that in battle. The Romans are shocked. They're so surprised by the thing, they don't have time to pull up Testudo, and hundreds of Romans go down. This rattles the Romans. They're like, whoa, we can't just chase these guys. Okay, we need to be a little more cautious. And the Persians start running up a hill. So now the Romans are slowly following after them. And the Persians turn around and shoot, but because the Romans have slowed down, they go back into Testudo, and not many are injured. They don't quite get into Testudo in time, so some of them do get injured. And so it slows the Romans down. They're getting a little nervous about all of this. But then the Persians go over the top of the hill. So now the Romans are like, well, we might as well run. They can't shoot through the hill. So they start running, and they run up the hill. And just as they're cresting the hill, to their shock and dismay, the Romans see 1,000 Cataphracts. Cataphracts were fully armored soldiers on top of armored horses. The first time Europeans will do that, put a fully armored man on top of an armored horse, is 14 centuries later. At the end of medieval Europe, the Persians were technologically 14 centuries ahead of any European society in terms of heavy cavalry. 1,000 cataphracts was far superior to 8,000 Roman cavalry, 
because they were, they were tanks. There was almost nothing you could do to them. And they're charging up the hill as the Romans are charging down the hill. So the Romans charging down the hill are trying to stop, and they're shouting to the guys behind them, hey, hey stop running. But the guys behind them can't really hear them, in part because some of them are on the other side of the hill, but in part because of all the noise. And the guys running down the hill can't stop running because if they do, they'll get knocked down and trampled to death. And so they're forced to run towards these cavalry units. They can't get into formation. And the cataphracts cut through them like a hot knife through butter. It's a catastrophe. Romans are dying everywhere. The cataphracts get to the top of the hill. They turn around and come back through. They get to the bottom of the hill. They turn around and come back through. The Romans are doing everything they can to try to create order and get back into combat formation, and they can't do it. Eventually, Crassus' son, who is up on the hill, gets identified by one of the Persian warriors. They kill him, cut off his head, stick it on a spike, and jam it into the ground so that his dad can see his head. The Romans are completely disheartened. Crassus comes up with a new strategy, because while the cataphracts are going up and down the hill, the horse archers return, and they're just shooting arrows at the Romans who can't get into formation, let alone go into Testudo. And so the Romans are getting hammered by arrows and cut to pieces by these heavy cavalry men. And so he decides, you know what we'll do? We'll just fight this until the Persians run out of arrows. It's always a bad day when your goal is to get the other side to run out of ammo because they're shooting at you. You know what I mean? It's also a really bad day when the Persians brought 1,000 camels loaded with 1,000 arrows each. They had a million arrows. And as the Persian horse archers are firing their arrows, the camels just ride up to them and hand them more. <laughs> For all intents and purposes, a million arrows versus 40,000 men, like the Persians had an unlimited supply of ammo. Crassus' strategy is a disaster. And the Persians, 9,000 soldiers are tearing these Romans to pieces. The only thing that saves the Romans is the sun goes down. And the Persians and the Romans basically call it. They break up into camps to eat and cook and then go to sleep. In the morning, Crassus comes out and he says, let's talk. And the Persian general, his name was Suren, he's on horse. And uh, Suren says, there's nothing to talk about. He, he had a stick with him. He draws a line in the ground, and he says, this side is Persian, this side is Rome. That line is the Euphrates River. And Crassus goes, no! And when he does, one of the Roman soldiers re freaks out, reaches over and grabs Suren, the rein of Suren's horses, and the fight starts again. Because <laughs> the Persians see that, and they just, swords come out, and they, and they just tear the Romans to pieces again on the second day. About 10,000 Romans escaped. About 10,000 Romans were captured, including Crassus. And 20,000 Romans were killed. And we don't have real firm number, but about 200 Persians died. When you outnumber the enemy five to one, and they kill you, at a ratio of 100 to 1, that's a bad day. That's a bad day. They wait until the Persian emperor shows up. His name is Orodes. Orodes brings Crassus into his tent. Crassus was wounded. He was in bad shape. The uh, Persian surgeons were, were treating him because they wanted to keep him alive so that Orodes could have a nice conversation with him. They kept him alive. They bring him forward. They have him get on his knees in front of the Persian emperor. And Orodas goes, the most important thing in Persian culture is to be a good host. You are my guest in the Persian empire. You came here for gold. I will provide. They pried open Crassus' mouth and they brought a pot of molten gold and they poured it down his throat. That event triggers 
almost 700 years of back and forth warfare between the Romans and the Persians, just back and forth. If you were to take all the, all the fights and sum them together, the Romans managed to keep, so this is, this is the border between the Romans and the Persians, they managed to keep something like this for most of that time period because the Romans had a fantastic navy in the Mediterranean. So every time the Persians would capture Syria or Palestine or Egypt or Anatolia, the Romans could respond with their navy and deploy troops behind the Persians. And then that made it so the Persians could never really hold any land to the west of their empire. But as a general rule, the Persians usually won. Not always, the Romans sometimes beat up on them. But in the third century, one Persian emperor, a guy named Shapur, beat three Roman emperors and in fact, so badly he captured one Roman emperor with two whole intact Roman legions. He was the first emperor, Roman emperor ever captured alive in battle. Crassus was not an emperor. He was a member of the Senate and he was a governor, but he wasn't an emperor. The first captured Roman emperor ever was Emperor Valerian. In case uh, you wanted to know that. <clears throat> Rome gets into really big trouble. In fact, so does Persia. They both get into really big trouble. In fact, all of Western civilization gets into really big trouble. And the reason is because of Indonesian fishermen. You know how they can go rogue. They're so dangerous. The Indonesians had discovered there were a bunch of islands through the middle of the Indian Ocean, and you could hop from island to island. So even though they didn't have truly ocean-worthy vessels, they had vessels that were ocean-worthy enough you could get between the islands. And that made it so that you could start in Indonesia and head towards Africa, crossing the Indian Ocean, and you can island hop your whole way across. And before they knew it, they were on this really big island to the east of Africa called Madagascar. And when they got there, there were no humans living on Madagascar. They were just lemurs, our ancestors, but no humans. And they went, Jesus set up a colony, and they did. And they began growing rice on the colony. And as they grew this rice, they began trading the rice with Africa. And before long, Africa itself began to grow the rice. And as they traded with other people, the rice began to spread across Africa until it got to places like Egypt. And before you knew it, rice was growing in Mesopotamia. And before you knew it, rice was growing even in southern parts of Europe. The reason why this is a problem is because to grow rice, you flood a field. And when you flood a field, you create a place for, for mosquitoes to grow, malaria-bearing mosquitoes. And malaria ends up tearing up the entire region from Spain to Iran populations, the life expectancies absolutely plunge. If they were 40, 45, they dropped to 20, 25. And as a result, Rome's population goes into dramatic decline and so does Iran's. And they're just barely scraping by. And then as if that's not enough, there's, there's an outbreak of the bubonic plague. It's frequently called uh, Justinian's uh, plague in the middle of the sixth century, and it tears Rome and Persia to pieces. Uh, the bubonic plague does this really weird thing where it looks like it, it's on an 800 year cycle, where it'll be dormant for 799 years. It'll wake up, tear through the human population for a year, maybe two, max, and then go dormant again. When I say tear through the human population, the last bubonic plague outbreak, which was 1348, killed 40% of Europeans in a one-year span of time. It killed 60% of uh, Middle Easterners and North Africans in the, that same year. So just put this in perspective, we're running about a 2% fatality rate with COVID, not a 50% fatality rate. Um, and then the bubonic plague goes back to sleep. For those of you 
uh, doing the math real quick, it's six and a half centuries. We got a century and a half left. And then it'll kick into high gear. I'm assuming this pattern isn't going to go away. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why it would all of a sudden. It's happened so many times now. I think we're on four or five. Um, so that's comforting to know. So by the time we get to the 6th century AD, the populations of both the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire are dramatically reduced. There are just simply fewer people living, which means less food, smaller armies, and a terrible economy. The Romans are barely made. So some of you might be a little confused because you've been taught that Rome fell in 476, and I want to just restate, Rome did not fall in 476 AD. Rome fell in 1453 AD, and that's nonsense. All Rome did was reunify so that there was only one emperor, and the capital was Constantinople, which in this map is spelled with a K. <clears throat> cool? So, um, <clears throat> There was a Roman emperor, his name was Mauricius, but of course we mispronounce everything, so I'll just say Morris, Maurice, oh, Morris. Uh, Mauricius is so much better. Emperor Mauricius had sided with a Persian, trying to become the Persian emperor in the middle of a Persian civil war. His name was Khosrow II. And when Mauricius, uh, when Khosrow succeeded, he, he felt like, since Mauricius had helped them so much, he had to work with them, and they became friends. And then a Roman general named Focus. Isn't that a good name? Like, because you know, like you're not, you're distracted, and your parent shouts, "Focus!" <laughs> it's just the perfect name for a kid. Um, general Focus was really angry because Mauricius had allowed a group of his of Focus's men to get killed in an ambush. And he, he, he held this really nasty grudge. Eventually, Focus ends up in Constantinople, and he murders the Roman emperor and makes himself the Roman emperor. So now Focus in 602 AD is the Roman emperor. Khosrow II, the Persian emperor, is outraged that his friend Mauricius has been killed like this. And so Khosrow declares war on Rome to avenge the death of his friend and to depose focus. <clears throat> Initially, the Persians have some successes, but they don't last, and the war sort of drags on, and a bunch of nothing gets done. And then, <clears throat> um, there's an uprising within the Roman Empire against focus. That uprising is led by a man named Heraclius, and Heraclius eventually takes over and becomes the new Roman Emperor. The problem is, is this war now has a life of its own. And so even though Focus is, is taken out of the picture and in effect Khosrow II gets his way, it doesn't matter anymore. They're in the war. They're just going to go ahead and fight it out. And to make a long story short, a, a, a Persian general, his name was uh, Shah Baraz. Uh, see where there's, there's parts of the Roman Empire that are they have uh, vertical lines through them. Shah Baraz carved that chunk of the Roman Empire off and, and began ruling it himself, basically, because he eventually himself rebels against the Persians. And so there actually ends up being three empires. One empire that stretches from Egypt to Armenia, ruled by Shah Baraz, the Persian Empire to the east and the Roman Empire to the west. Um, Eventually, Heraclius makes a deal with Shah Baraz to try to make him the new emperor to end the war. Uh, Heraclius actually ended up raising Shah Baraz's son. His name was Niketas, and he raised him as a Christian. And so Emperor Heraclius is thinking Niketas will eventually become the Christian ruler of the Persian Empire. The, the struggle between Rome and Persia will finally end. And so he, he pushes really hard, backs Shah Baraz. Shah Baraz finally takes over Tisiphon, the Persian capital, in 628. So this war went 26 years. He takes over the Persian capital, becomes the Persian emperor. He even mints a coin with his face on it, and 40 days later is stabbed to death. 
but the war ended, so that was good. <laughs> it's just the goal wasn't achieved. 628. It, and this is where the intersection takes place between the story I wanted to tell you and the, and the background that I gave you. <clears throat> in 610, in Arabia, so if you went right off the map to the south, that's where Mecca is. And, and then Stephen's going to scroll down for us, right there, where it says Makkah. Um, there is a man who receives prophecy from the Archangel Gabriel, and his name is Muhammad, and he becomes the prophet who will create Islam. I'm not going to give you the whole story, but I just want to make sure that we're clear approximately what we're talking about. In 622, the people of Mecca kick him and his followers out. So for 12 years, he, he, he built his religion in Mecca. He's kicked out by the Meccans who hate his religion, in, in part because they're worried that his religion is going to interfere with their prophets, but also his religion might replace their religion. When, when the Prophet Muhammad created Islam, his original goal was to take Christianity and Judaism and reunite them. He believed that it was a that it was an accident that Judaism and Christianity got separated, and he believed he had received the word of God to fix that and put it back together. But as time goes by, he concludes that the Christians and the, and the Jews don't want anything to do with his new religion, and he realizes he's created a third Abrahamic religion, and it's separate. He ends up in 622 doing the Hijra, which takes him to Yathrib, which on this map is, is spelled Yathrib, and the, the people there in Yathrib take him in, and eventually the city gets renamed Medina the Nebi, which means the city of the prophet. Today we just call it Medina. So if you look at a map, you won't see Yathrib on there, a modern map. You'll see Medina. That's that city. <clears throat> in 625, the Muslims are going to have a fight with the Meccans, a battle, Uhud. And the Meccans beat the Muslims. In 627, the Meccans attack Yathrib, and they fight a battle called the Battle of the Trench. Khalid ibn Walid was a soldier in both of those battles. In 625, he was there when the Meccans defeated Muhammad and the Muslims, and he was fighting for the Meccans against the Muslims. In 627, he's there again at the Battle of the Trench, where the Muslims defeat the Meccans. Afterwards, and we don't know exactly when, but within two years, he, he switches sides and he converts to Islam. <clears throat> in 629, that's why I know it's within two years, he's marching with uh, soldiers from Yathrib north. So see where it says Petra? Go to the east of that, there's a city called, or a town called Muta. And he marches towards Muta with this army. 3,000 Arabs, 3,000 Muslim Arabs. And their goal is to attack the Roman Empire, because they're in it. See where it says Bani Hassan? The Hassanids were Christian Arabs who fought for the Romans. Where it says uh, Banu Lah, those were Christian Arabs who fought for the Persians. So I'm going to have to be careful here when I say Arabs. What I mean, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to remember to say Muslim Arabs so that you know I'm not talking about the Christian Arabs fighting for the Romans or the Persians, right? But for the record, there are Jewish Arabs too in the whole mix, just to make it really complicated. In any case, they, they, they march to Muta. The Romans find out there's this Muslim army coming towards them. They don't, they're not, they don't take it very seriously, but they take it seriously enough, they dispatch a force to go meet them we don't know the exact size of the Roman force. I'm, I would bet you like a, a dollar, maybe a dollar ten, that it was about 10,000 soldiers. Um, his, uh, sources from the time period said it was 100,000. I find that really hard to believe because the Romans were having so much trouble fielding a force. And why would you bring 100,000 men to fight 3,000 3, men? It seems unlikely. But anyway, the number is probably 10,000, maybe 20,000, it's not 100,000. So the Arabs are deployed, the Muslim Arabs are deployed against Christian Arabs who are fighting for the Romans, and the Romans outnumber them probably three or four or five to one, maybe six to one, maybe seven to one, it's bad. 
and they fight instead of running away like they should have. And they, they get the crap beat out of them. And the, the Muslim Arabs are just in bad trouble and they keep retreating, they keep retreating. One commander after another dies. Finally, the last commander turns to Khalid ibn Walid and goes, I want you to figure out how to get us out of here. <laughs> and hands him the banner to put him in command of, of the Arab army, the Muslim Arab army. And what Khalid ibn Walid does is he'll take soldiers and he'll give them a banner and he'll have them sneak around a hill at night. So they're behind the hill. And then in the daytime, he'll have them come over the top of the hill. And then when they arrive where the Arab army is, he secretly sneaks them another banner. They sneak around the backside of the hill and then they'll come over the top of it again. And then he gives them another banner and then they'll go around the back of the hill and they'll come over the top. So the Romans watching this are like, man, look at all the reinforcements they're getting. And it was just the same group of guys that just kept marching in a circle around this hill. And then when the sun went down, he would have each man set five, ten campfires and then try to keep walking around in front of the campfires. So the Romans watching it would not only see a bunch of campfires, they would see all these men walking in front of the campfires. <laughs> and he just kept doing these tricks. And what it did was it kept the Romans from attacking because the Romans thought, man, I don't know how big that force is. There's so many of them. And he kept doing this until he finally got far enough away from the Roman, Roman army. He could just tell his men to run, let's run. And they ran. That is the only battle Khalid ibn Walid was in command of where he didn't win. It was the first time he was ever in command and he was put in command after they had already lost in circumstances that were impossible to win. The Prophet Muhammad will eventually capture Mecca, and when he does, he'll own the western part of Arabia and the very eastern part of Arabia, but not the rest of it. And this is important because Arabia had never, ever, ever in its entire history up until that moment been ruled by a single political entity. Not, the Arabians had never ruled Arabia, the Persians had never ruled Arabia, the Ethiopians had never ruled Arabia, the Romans had never ruled Arabia. At one point, the, the Ethiopians had captured a piece of Arabia, the Yemen. Uh, one, and then, of course, the Persians have that chunk over there in the northeast, and the Romans had that chunk in the northwest. But no one had ever ruled all of Arabia as a single political entity. The closest anybody had come, in fact, was the Prophet Muhammad. When he died in 632, he had gotten such a big chunk, he probably had about 40% of Arabia. He was replaced by a name, guy named Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr didn't take the title king. He didn't take the title emperor. He took the title follower of the messenger of God and became the ruler of this Muslim-controlled chunk of Arabia. He, he made two armies. He sent one army from Yatrib due east, and he sent the other army south to Yemen. And his goal is to finally, once and for all, conquer Arabia and rule it. And actually, he was ruling from Mecca at that point. The guy he put in charge of his army that went east was Khalid ibn Walid. And Khalid will, will do a series of battles against a heretic who is claiming to be the real prophet in, in, a, in an event called the Ridha Wars. And Khalid will win battle after battle after battle. And by 633, Arabia is unified. So the campaign started in 632. It took less than a year and in part because of Khalid's decisive victories in the center of Arabia. At that point, there's argument amongst historians exactly what happened next. Did Abu Bakr order Khalid to keep going, or did he tell Khalid to stop? It's entirely possible either is true. He doesn't stop. That's the important thing. Whether he was told to stop or told to keep going, he doesn't stop, and he goes, towards the very southern tip of Iraq. Um, so see where it says Sabur? He's headed in that direction. 
He ends up fighting a battle in what is today Kuwait. It's called the Battle of the Chains. The Persian general Hormuz uh, chains up his elite soldiers to show the, the Arabs that there is no retreat, that the Persians will fight to the death that, because they've made it so they can't retreat because they're chained together. But also because Khalid relied heavily on, it, on cavalry, it would be impossible to do a cavalry charge through them because there are chains in between them, so there's no way to get through. What Khalid liked to, what, what, the way battles went back then, everybody did this, the Persians, the Romans, everybody did this, is they would send champions to go fight each other before the battle. But what the Arabs liked to do was first poetry. So they would get their best improv poet because they would improv, they would improv right there. They didn't, they didn't have a poem written in advance. And they would get that poet to shout to the other army a poem. And the belief was that if you shouted a good enough poem, you should, the other side should give you the field and walk away. And of course, the Persians are like, screw you, we don't even speak Arabic, we don't know what you're saying. So after the Arab shouts this poetry at the Persians who are annoyed, <clears throat> Khaled walks out and says, I'm my champion. I'll fight the Persian champion. That's a problem for the Persian general then, because if he doesn't go fight, it's general versus general. If he doesn't make it general versus general, it makes him look like a coward. So the Persian general goes, okay, let me fight. And they go out and they fight, and Khaled ibn Walid kills him within like 30 seconds. <laughs> It's a really quick fight. And so now the Persians are going to go into the battle without their general. And what Khaled did was he just kept using his cavalry to do these charges against the Persians that just kept them off balance, kept them off balance until finally he broke up their order. And what they should have done was they should have repositioned or they should have retreated a little bit and then repositioned, but they can't because they're chained together. And he swings his cavalry around the backside and starts harassing them and he tears them to pieces. The estimate is, that he brought 18,000 men against 20,000 Persians, the same Persians who tore those Romans to pieces almost 700 years prior. And he walked away with a couple hundred uh, killed and the Persians lost and most were killed or captured. And then what he's gonna do is he's gonna work his way along the western bank of the Euphrates River and his goal is the city that's labeled as Herat there. At the time, it was called Hira, um, or at least the Arabs called it Hira. And, and he's heading towards Hira. And he'll fight uh, three more battles, the rivers uh, Walaja, and I'm drawing Ulais, Walaja Ulais in the river. And at one of the battles, I don't remember which one, I'm slightly embarrassed, but not really. There's 50 battles, dude. I can't keep all this straight in my head. At one of the battles, one of the Persian generals is like, screw this, because Khaled kept going, I'll be your champion. And he walks out, and now the Persian general is stuck doing the same thing. And the first thing that happens in the opening moments of the battle is the Persian general gets killed. <laughs> and so this Persian general goes, okay, I bet that bastard's going to do this again. So he buried a dozen Persian soldiers in the battlefield right where they, he thought the challenge would take place with straws so they could breathe through it. He buried them in the night so that in the morning they would come out and do the challenge. And then what was supposed to happen is once the challenge started, the 12 Persian soldiers would jump up and they just murder Khaled <laughs> right there. So Khaled walks out, the Persian general walks out, the 12 men jump up, and one of Khaled's cousins was in the army, the, Arab, the Muslim Arab army. And he's like, that's not fair. And he runs out and joins Khaled and the two men murder the 13 Persians. And then they destroy the Persian army. And he would use different tactics every time. And one of the battles, what he did was he had, he had snuck two cavalry units behind a hill and the Persians were in between his men on the other side of the hill and his army, and he just kept slowly backing his army up and making a circle, a half circle out of it. So the Persians would kind of go into the middle, and then he signaled his cavalry that came riding over the hill and attacked the Persians from behind, completely surrounded, destroys them. He captures Hira, and then on the way, 
So C where it says Peraz uh, Sabur, that is Anbar, the city of Anbar in Iraq, in Iraq today. He's heading towards that place. That's where he wants to go. And he's going to fight three battles, one after the other in succession. And here's what he does. So there were 60,000 Persian soldiers in three separate armies, 20,000 each. And they're coming for him. And by this, time, by this point, he's down to 15,000 men. Because even though he keeps winning, he's still taking losses. So it's going to be four to one odds if he lets those three Persian armies merge together. And he's thinking, I don't think I can beat 60,000 men with 15,000 men. So if I'm going to win, I'm going to have to attack them piecemeal. I'm going to have to hit each of the three Persian units before they get together. So he races his army as fast as he can towards the first one. But first, he cuts his army into three 5,000-man units. And he, and he tells them, we're, we're going to arrive at 2 a.m. And he gives them a date, like two weeks in advance. And he says, I need you at this location, at this time, on this day. Go. And they take three different paths. And they're going to they're come at this Persian unit. And he's guessing where he thinks that Persian unit will have arrived to by that point. I challenge you. This is my challenge. Three of you, you and two of your best friends, get into three separate cars. And you can use GPS. Pick a spot somewhere on the other side of the US, because it needs to be a long road trip, right? Three days. Not, I don't, I'm not even going to make it two weeks, just three days. So I don't care where you want to go, Washington or the other Washington. Either way, it'll work out to be about the same. But make the three of you take three separate paths and then time it so that you arrive at the exact same moment. Bet you can't do it. Now take away GPS <laughs> and navigate at night, trying to guess where you think the enemy army is going to be. They're there when the three armies converge at the exact same moment. They catch the Persians asleep in their camp. They tear them to pieces. He's like, all right, one down, two to go. He looks at his men and he goes, this is where the Persian army is going to, the next one's going to be. And he tells them, I want you there this day, this time. Go, three different ways. And the three units charge as fast as they can. And they get there. And the Persian army is there. And he destroys that one too. And then he tells his men, all right, we got one more. One more. And go. And they arrive at the right time, on the right day, in the spot where the Persians were at night. And they wiped out the third 20,000 man unit with almost no losses. They dispatched 60,000 men in a maneuver that I bet a contemporary military force would never be able to execute, let alone three times in a row. Insane. It shouldn't be doable. He gets to where it says Dura. That's the city of Firaz. Firaz was the border between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. The Persians and the Romans hated each other's guts. They had been fighting each other. Six, 628 plus 52, right? It was 53 BC, the Battle of Karhae, but there's no year zero, so you have to subtract one. That's why I'm doing 52. So what, what is 28 plus 52? 80. For 680 years, the Romans and the Persians had been fighting each other. Can you comprehend 680 years of war? For, like, I don't even know what that means. What, do you, what does that even mean? By the time Khalid ibn Walid gets to Firaz, the Persians and the Romans looked at each other and went, we are no, you are no longer the enemy. We have a new enemy. I don't know where these guys even came from. Because you have to remember, at, the, at this point in time, the Persians had been an empire for 1,200 years. 
And the Romans had officially been an empire, calling themselves an empire for 600 years, but they had been imperial for the 300 before that, because even before Rome was an empire, it owned Spain, it owned North Africa, it owned Syria, it owned Turkey, it owned Greece, right? And so you have 900 years of imperial history for the Romans and 1200 years of imperial history for the Persians. There's 21 centuries between those two empires. And they're also technologically the most advanced civilizations on earth. And they had massive populations compared to the Arabs. They're down because of malaria, but the Arabs don't have any rivers. They don't have the agriculture capacity to support large populations. The Arabs are outnumbered, they're out technology, they're out moneyed, they're out experienced, they're out equipped. And Khalid in one year has captured Iraq. Our military was there for eight years. We didn't capture anything. We captured IEDs in the face. So the, the Persians go to the Romans, they're like, okay, we're gonna fight this one as allies, right? And the Romans are like, yes, yeah, we're good. Because in the meantime, an Arab army has attacked from this side and is trying to get to Jerusalem. And so the Romans know that the, that the Arabs, you're outnumbered, you're out technology, you're out money, and you're facing two empires. Do you attack both at the same time? That makes no sense, but it's exactly what the Arabs did. They attacked the two oldest, most powerful empires at the same time, even though they were outnumbered by one, let alone both. And so the Romans are like, yeah, yeah, we'll work with you. So at Firaz, the combined Roman and Persian armies, which by the way, was largely made up of Christian Arabs, not, in, not completely, but there was a huge contingent, probably about 50,000 Christian Arabs. The combined Persian and Roman army was 150,000 men against 15,000 Muslim Arabs. So Khaled arrives. Khaled is on the east bank of the Euphrates. The Persians and the Romans are on the west bank. There's a ford and a bridge, which is convenient if you're moving an army. It's nice. And so Khaled is on the, Khaled needs the Persians and the Romans to cross the river to fight. So he very politely backs his army up from the bridge in the ford and split it into three 5,000 man units. He liked that. And he put one upriver, one downriver, and then pulled the other one away from the river. And he just waited. So the Persians and Romans start to cross the bridge and the, they're also crossing the ford at the same time. And he waits and he waits and he waits. And then he does a prayer as he's waiting. And he says, God, if you give me this victory, I will go to Mecca and I will do the Hajj. I know I'm gonna die. I know there's no way we're gonna defeat 150,000 men today, but that's what I will do. I'll, go, I'll run and I'll do the Hajj. And, uh, and I'm actually happy that I get to die as a warrior here today. When 50,000 Persians and Romans had crossed the Euphrates, he blew a horn. The men that were up and down river attacked them by going along the river bank and tried to then merge at the bridge in the ford so that they would cut the guys who had crossed off from the guys on the other side. Then what Khaled did was he took the 5,000 men who, against 50,000, and he has them charge into him. And he had, the, he had his men as thin as possible. And then he backs his men up and then he charges again, and then he backs his men up, and he charges again. And every time his horses go in to those men, it, it compressed them a little bit. It compressed them a little bit more. So after a while, the Persians and the Romans are so compressed, they can't move their arms, they can't swing their weapons. He's just compacted them together, and they realize what he's done to them, and they panic, and they turn around to run back to the river to cross it, 
50,000 men turning all at once to stampede. You could hear the bones breaking. And then the Muslim Arabs just went in and started killing them as they were running. By the time the battle was done, 200 Muslim Arabs were dead. 50,000 Persians and Romans were dead. What, what is this? <laughs> Khaled's like, okay, I'm alive. That's a surprise. And so what he does is he, he orders his men back to Hira. So what he does is he says, okay, I need to arrive at Hira. I need to show up on top at the front of my army, but I've got to now go to Mecca to do this Hajj. So he takes his fastest horses and his best men, and they race across the desert as fast as they can. They get to Mecca. He puts on a hood so that nobody will see his face. He quickly does the Hajj. He jumps back on a horse, and he rides as fast as he can. He gets to the front of his army just as it's arriving at Hira, and he assumes the position as if he was there the whole time, and he marches his men into the city. And a few days later, a messenger arrives from Mecca sent by Abu Bakr, the Khalif, and it said, you were spotted in Mecca, don't do that again. <laughs> Abu Bakr then orders him to invade Syria. So he's gonna basically miss Dura, he's gonna go south of Dura, and he's heading towards Damascus. That's his goal, is to capture Damascus. Because the, the, the Muslim Arabs are thinking if they capture Damascus, They'll get Jerusalem in the aftermath because the Romans will be, there'll be an Arab army north of the Roman army and they won't be able to maintain their supply lines. So they'll, they'll just simply retreat. And that's how they'll capture Jerusalem. Khaled takes his men across this really nasty chunk of desert in a logistical feat that would be hard to re replicate with a contemporary army today. He just takes his men through a spot that has no water and no food, and he gets them across. They show up in Syria, they come up to Damascus, and he captures the city. At that point, Emperor Heraclius is tearing his hair out, trying to figure out what to do, because all of this is a shock and a surprise. Nobody ever thought the Arabs were a threat. Where is this even coming from? So Heraclius, goes to Antioch, which is on that map as Antiochia, but it's Antioch. And uh, they had renamed it uh, Theopolis, which is city of God. And he shows up and he's hunkered down in there and he gets together his generals and he decides to launch a counterattack. And, and what Heraclius' idea is you send four Roman armies, and you catch the four Arab, Muslim Arab armies in four separate locations, and you take them out piecemeal. Heraclius does not want to ever have a situation where he's bringing all four of his armies together because he doesn't have the economy to support having that many men in one location. There's just too few people. The infrastructure has fallen apart. Word reaches that the Muslims that there are these four armies now coming towards them. The commander of the four armies is a guy named Ubaidah, Abu Ubaidah. Abu Ubaidah uh, was told that he was in command and Khalid was relieved of command. He could still be a general, but he would not be the guy in charge. And the reason is, is because the new Khalif, Abu Bakr, only lived two years as Khalif, he's dead. He's replaced by a guy named Omar ibn al-Khattab. The new Khalif is Khalid's first cousin, and he doesn't trust Khalid. He thinks Khalid has political ambitions, and so he's worried that if people like him too much because he's too amazing, he'll eventually try to become the new Khalif, and he'll do a political coup. So he demotes Khalid, and, and, but so Abu Ubaidah orders the Arab armies to head over towards uh, where it says uh, al Jabiya. Uh, the problem is the, the Hassanids keep attacking them from behind. And so the, the Muslims try to figure out what to do. They decide to hold a conference. 
And then what they do is they ask an interesting question. Abu Ubaidah does, the commander. And the question he asks is, would you guys rather have Khalid in charge or me? And everybody looks at, looks at him like, you know, we feel guilty saying this, but yeah, Khalid. <laughs> and he goes, me too. I would like to propose that we promote Khalid to being in command unofficially because I'll be officially in command. But, but unofficially, he'll be in charge. And everybody votes yes. And so he takes command of the army, even though he can't because he's been demoted. And uh, he comes up with a plan. And the plan is to head back a little ways towards Damascus to get away from the Ghassanids to a spot where the, the Muslim army, I don't know how I should do this. Should I aim myself like this? It's weird talking to you with my back. Well, I'll do it this way. So on the south end of the Muslim army is this giant ravine. And then there's a plateau. It's called the Plain of Yarmouk. And the ravine is the ravine of Yarmouk. And then across from the ravine is another ravine. So you can't really use them as an army because you'd be falling off a cliff to go into them. They're really steep. So he's got his left flank, his southern flank, covered by this ravine. And they just wait, which now forces, because now all four of the Arab armies are in one location, it forces the Romans to bring their armies together, which they didn't want to do. The commander of the Roman army is an Armenian named Vahan. But a huge chunk of this Roman army, probably about a quarter of it, was actually made up of Arabs, Christian Arabs. So this is going to be an Arab versus Arab fight at some core level. Vahan brings his army up and he puts it in between the second ravine in the west and the, the Muslim army. On day one, he does a really light, gentle probing attack just to try to figure out uh, what he's up against, how the Arabs are going to respond to his attack. He's just, just going up and touching to figure out what's going on. The, uh, the Arabs feel the pressure because they're outnumbered again. Now, this isn't Firaz level outnumbered, but it's still bad. We don't know the exact numbers, but it's probably in the ballpark that there were 120,000 Romans and about 40,000 Muslim Arabs. So the Muslim Arabs are outnumbered by about three to one. And so Vahan is just sort of checking things out because he knows these Muslim Arabs are good fighters. He doesn't want to do anything risky on day one. The sun goes down, they disengage, a few hundred people are wounded or killed. It's not heavy casualties. <clears throat> on day two, Vahan decides he's going to have the Roman left flank and the Roman right flank hit the Muslim army as hard as it can because he figures he's got the numerical advantage, hit them as hard as you can. So he orders that. The Muslim commander on the left is a guy named Yazid, and the Muslim commander on the right is a guy named Amr ibn al-As. And, and, and Abu Ubaidah is in the middle, the guy who's supposed to be in charge. And then Khalid's in the back c controlling everything. And the weight of the Roman army is so overwhelming both Muslim flanks are collapsing and they're in full retreat. And uh, in the north, on the Muslim right flank, the women, so it's worth pointing something out that's actually really interesting. Women have always been an integral part of warfare in all times. We pretend like we've just recently let women in the militaries. The Persians had an all woman archer division. The stories about the Amazons, that wasn't made up. That mythology was based on a real event. A, a rogue archer division of women, we don't know why, decided to go on a tear and attacked a bunch of Greek city-states on the Aegean Sea and burnt their temples and set their shit on fire. Oh, I cussed. I said I wouldn't. Uh, and they deserved it just for the record. <laughs> and then the Greeks were so traumatized by this, they, they were like, we were attacked by Amazons. And they were, and it really did happen. Isn't that cool? 
I think it's cool. Usually, women were support staff. They weren't in direct combat roles. Notice I didn't say always, I said usually. For example, the Vikings fielded women. The Persians, the Vikings, the Armenians fielded women. The Romans did not ever field women. They were against it. But women still played a support role in, their, in, the, in Roman legions. And the Arabs were the same. They, they did have some women warriors, by the way, just so we're clear. Um, but for the most part, mo there were very few women who participated directly in battle. In any case, the women on Amr ibn al-As's side uh, pulled down the tents, grabbed the posts, and charged the men who were retreating. And they shout at them, you've, you've shamed your wives, and now you have a choice. You can be killed by your wives, or you can be killed by the Romans. Bahan's blown away. He can't believe that he attacked a, a, an army a third the size. They broke it. It rallied and pushed them back. But he thinks, I've got it. I've killed enough of them. This was a bloody enough affair. I can probably break them the next day. So the next day, which is really day three at this point, he decides to focus everything he's got on the, the Muslim right flank. So he's going to ignore half the Muslim army. He takes everything and he smashes it in. And sure enough, the Muslims are being pushed back and the women take the tent posts back and are holding it a line against their own men. And the Arab men turn around and re-engage and they stabilize the situation. Khalid brings his cavalry units around and he smashes into the Roman flanks that are attacking and they slowly push the Romans back. And day three ends right where it began. Vahan is now really upset because he can't comprehend how he's not moving this Arab army, but he thinks, okay, I think we're still in this. So day four, he decides to do the same thing, push that same Muslim right flank, just hit him as hard as you can with everything you've got. And the Khalid this time had assumed this was gonna happen. So what he had done is he had redeployed his cavalry so that it would be able to respond more quickly and he manages to stabilize the flank, even though it does start to collapse. They do start to fall back, and they manage to push the Romans back, and they stop day four, right where they started. Day five, Vahan sends a guy to talk. And he's, he's ready to come up with a compromise. Like, maybe you get Jerusalem and we keep Damascus, something like that. Khaled goes, oh, the Romans only talk when they're losing. Okay, I'm going to refuse to talk. Day six, he took all his cavalry. It was about 8,000 men. Out of his 40,000 men, about 8,000 were cavalry. And he put all of them on his right flank. When the, when the sun came up, he swung it around. So now the Romans are trapped between his army and the two ravines. There was a bridge over the western ravine. During the night, he had sent 500 cavalry around through the plain. They had snuck down into the ravine, and they had captured the bridge. And his goal is to get the Romans to run towards the bridge, because there's nowhere to go, because the Muslims actually have the bridge, just the Romans don't know. And he comes swinging over the top, and he smashes the Roman left flank really hard. He breaks the Roman cavalry unit that was there, and he breaks the Roman army that was there. It's the cavalry unit and the army start to retreat. They're running in to other Roman units, sending them into disarray. And then the Romans try to respond with heavy cavalry. Vahan sees what's happening. He organizes cavalry. He, he draws it in, but it's heavy cavalry and it's slow. Khaled comes in with his light cavalry and he attacks them before they can get into more formation destroys them, then he takes his cavalry and he slams it into the back of the Roman army. It breaks and goes into full retreat. And that's how he took 40,000 men against 120,000 men at Yarmouk and destroyed them. Vahan got away with, with a cavalry detachment. Khaled grabbed his fastest horses and his best men and they took off and they chased General Vahan. And they caught up with him just outside of Damascus. And Khaled lets his men tear up Vahan's men. 
until the only man standing is Vahab. And Khaled had told his men, don't touch him. And then he comes up to Vahan and he says, you are a man, a man's man. And so I'm going to give you a man's death. And they dueled one on one and he kills Vahan. And then Khaled goes and recaptures Damascus. Emperor Heraclius holds a council and he asks his remaining generals, what should we do? And the generals tell him, we've lost Syria, it's done. There's nothing we can do about it. And so Heraclius gets on a ship and he says, farewell Syria, you have been a lovely province and now you will be a lovely province for the Arabs. And he withdraws. And that was the last time, second to last time, there was a Roman army in Syria. They'll, they'll get in one more time, but they don't really keep it for long. Khaled and his army now return to Jerusalem, which on this map is Hiro Sulima, in case you were wondering. And when they get there, um, the Romans have largely abandoned it, the Roman military has. But there's enough people manning the walls that you can't get in. So the Arab army is stuck outside trying to figure out how to get inside so they can capture this holy city. The Archbishop of Jerusalem, a man named Sophronius, by the way, a Christian Arab, a loyal Roman citizen, indicates he's willing to negotiate, but only with Omar ibn al-Khattab, the Caliph. Well, the Caliph is all the way back in Mecca it'll be weeks before he can be sent for and then return. So they come up with a scheme. And the scheme is, since Khalid is Omar ibn al-Khattab's first cousin, he actually looks like him. So they pretend Khalid ibn Walid is the Khalif. They meet with Sophronius, and while they're talking, somebody had actually met Omar ibn al-Khattab, I'm sorry, had met Khalid ibn Walid and knew that was Khalid. And so he tells Sophronius, you're being duped, it's not really the Khalif, it's some other dude, it's that general that, that's been tearing us up. Sophronius is outraged, he goes, you lied to me, and he, he calls off the negotiations for the surrender. So now the arms are stuck getting the Khalif. Sophronius comes out of the gates weeks later to meet the Caliph because he sees the Caliph's army arrive. And as he's approaching, he sees a man leading a camel at the front of the army. So for the record, the rich Arabs, the Arabs who were good soldiers, didn't usually ride camels. They usually rode horses, Arabians. And for those of you who don't know, Arabians are fast and agile, and they have crazy personality. And so they're, they're perfect for warfare. Camels are a little bit clumsy and slow. They serve a purpose in warfare, but you're better off on an Arabian. In any case, the Arab army is being led by a man leading a camel with a man on the camel. So Sophronius, he's got a giant red hat, because he's also a cardinal, right? He's got gold tassels, actual gold, hanging from his hat. He's covered in gold jewelry. He's wearing red robes. He's covered in perfume. He's on a lectica. The lectica was the couch that the Romans would ride, and then they'd have like four or eight men, depending how big it is, carrying it. And then he has two men, one on each side, fanning him. Of course, right? That's what Jesus would want from his bishops. It's exactly right. And he's coming out on this lectica being fanned. And he comes up to the guy on the camel and he says, uh, where is the caliph? And the guy on the camel does like this. He nods with his head at the guy leading the camel. So Sophronius turns to the guy leading the camel and goes, where's the caliph? And the guy leading the camel says, I'm the caliph. And Sophronius goes, dude, you're dressed in rags. The guy's pants were, ha were mended multiple times, his shirt was mended multiple times, and he goes, no, no, I'm the caliph. And Sophronius goes, 
you've just conquered Iraq and Syria and all of Palestine minus Jerusalem. How is it you're so poor? And the caliph goes, well, why would I collect wealth? I'm, we're not doing this war because I'm trying to plunder anything. I'm a humble man with humble needs. I just need good meal. And then Siphonius goes, why aren't you riding the camel? And Omar goes, uh, that's my servant on the camel. And we take turns so that neither one of us gets exhausted. At this point, Siphonius is like, oh, what? who just conquered us? What are these Marxists? And so Siphonius gets off the lectica <laughs> because he's shamed off of the thing. And he says, okay, uh, I, I want to talk to you about our surrendering the city to you. And, and, and the caliph says, I have an idea. Let's walk to the city and I'll tell you what I was thinking the terms would be. And then, and then so we'll start there. And Sephoris goes, yes, of course. And as they're walking, Omar ibn al-Khattab says, why don't we do this? All Roman politicians leave Jerusalem. You just go if you're a politician. So if you're a top bureaucrat, a, an officer, and you can take anything you can carry. So you can take gold, as long as you can carry. And Sophronius goes, okay. Uh, I mean, that's reasonable. That's actually more than reasonable. I, I just assumed you'd enslave them and take their gold. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see how anybody would be mad about that. And then what else? And the caliph goes, oh no, I was thinking that's it. Uh, we, we don't do anything else. And Sophronius goes, wait a minute, I am really confused. So when us Romans capture a city, we enslave a segment, we plunder the city, probably a little bit too much raping too. We might even burn some of it, just for grins and giggles. And then we declare it to be ours. What about that? And Omar al -Khattab, ibn al-Khattab goes, no, 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 we're not going to do any of that. No plundering, no raping, no enslaving. We don't do that stuff. And then Sophronius goes, oh, but you're going to like seize property in the city. And, so, and the caliph goes, no, no, we're not going to take anybody's property. We're going to leave the city exactly like it is. The only thing I want to do is eject the Roman politicians with whatever they can carry. And Sophronius goes, there's nothing to negotiate. Yeah, we surrender the city this instant. I, I don't understand, actually. They walk into the city. Khalid is one of the men following. Amr ibn al-As, all these guys, they're on foot. If, if they've got their horses with them, they're leading their horses by the reins, right? Because the leadership is on foot. There's no way they're going to ride in. They're walking. And this is a holy city to them because Jesus is holy to them, because the Jews were holy to them. And so they, they see this as a holy city. Sophronius goes, you, tell me about your religion as they're walking through the streets. And so Omar ibn al-Khattab starts telling him about Islam. Sophonius goes, it just sounds like a variation of Christianity. I, I feel like our religions are shockingly similar. And Omar ibn al-Khattab goes, yeah, because they are. I mean, we thought we were doing uh, Judaism 3.0. It never occurred to us that we were going to be received as being so different. And uh, he goes, okay, since you've given us such amazing surrender terms. My alarm is going on, and I can't turn it off, and it's so embarrassing. It's telling me to put my kids to bed. Um, <clears throat> I should have remembered to turn it off, but it didn't occur to me. He says, you've given us such amazing surrender terms, and because I feel such kinship with your religion, will you do me an honor? Will you come to my church and pray in your Muslim way next to me as I pray in my Christian way? And Omar ibn al-Khattab goes, never. And Sophronius goes, why? He goes, I'm the caliph. The first place I pray in Jerusalem is going to become a mosque. The Muslims will take it and they will create a place of worship for Muslims. 
and you will lose it. And I don't want you to lose your church. And Sophronius goes, oh, uh, okay. What if we find an empty piece of Jerusalem and we just pray there? And Omar go, Ibn al-Khattab goes, yes, I accept. An empty piece, something that nobody owns. So they go and they find an empty lot and they pray. The archbishop in his Christian way, the caliph in his Muslim way, side by side. It is a mosque today, that spot, commemorating the first place that the first Muslim caliph prayed in, in Jerusalem. He nailed it. He, he knew what was coming. And he saved the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for Christians because that's the church Sophronius wanted him to pray in. At that point, the caliph says, I want to see the Temple Mount. And Sophronius goes, why? And the caliph goes, because it's holy. It's holy to everybody. It's holy to Christians. It's holy to Jews. It's holy to Muslims. And Sophronius goes, nah, we haven't been treating it as holy to anybody. And Omar ibn al-Khattab goes, what do you mean? And so Sophronius says, so after we tore down the second temple of Solomon, when we conquered Palestine, we turned the Temple Mount into a garbage dump to punish the Jews. And, so, and the caliph goes, what do you mean? And Sophronius goes, yeah, we've been, there's like 500 years of refuse on that thing. It's just a garbage dump. And he goes, show me. They walk up to the Temple Mount and the caliph can't believe what he's looking at. He falls on his knees and he begins clearing the garbage by his hands. His army sees their leader on his knees clearing garbage and they run up and they start clearing the garbage themselves. And they clear the garbage off the Temple Mount. The caliph goes, okay, I want to meet some of the Jews living in Jerusalem. And Sophronius goes, there are no Jews in Jerusalem. And the caliph goes, what do you mean there's no Jews in Jerusalem? The city is holy to the Jews. How could there be no Jews? And he says, well, us Christians, we pretty much murder them every chance we get. We really hate Jews. In fact, in the war we just did against the Persians, the Jews sided with the Persians. And so we murdered 20,000 Jews in Jerusalem and completely purged the city of its remaining Jewish population. And Omar ibn al-Khattab goes, no, this is wrong. You can't do this. And so he turns to a convert to Islam, a Jewish convert to Islam, and he says, I need you to find me 80 Jewish families that were willing to volunteer to move to Jerusalem so we can reestablish a Jewish presence in this city. And that's how the Muslims conquered Jerusalem. And that's the stuff that's left out of your history books. Isn't that crazy? Because isn't that an amazing story? After Jerusalem, Omar turns to Khalid and goes, I know you fought at Yarmouk, and I know you impersonated me. I really hate you. You're going to go to Mecca, and you're going to spend the rest of your days there. You're not, no more combat for you. I'm retiring you. And I actually don't think he died in Mecca. He did leave, but he never fought another battle. That was it. That was the end of his military career. He, was, he died in bed at age 50. I don't know what, what was ailing him. Something got him. And his final words were, you cannot put your hand anywhere on my body without touching a combat wound. I am covered in scars. It was my dream that God would let me die as a man on the field of battle. Here I am, in a bed, dying like a cow. And that's where I'm going to end the story.